What's going on YouTube? This is Ipsec, and I want to take probably 30, 45 minutes to talk about this tunable exploit that came out in early October. And if you've been living under a rock and don't know about it, it is a local privesk in glibc. So it impacts a lot of Linux distros like uh, Fedora 37, 38, Ubuntu 22, 23, Debian 12 and 13. Uh, one of the odd ones that is not impacted is Alpine Linux, but when you dig into it, Alpine doesn't use glibc, it uses muscle. So that's why it's not impacted. It is a big deal because, well, it is a local privest that has a um, large number of machines that are vulnerable, but I don't think it's a sky is falling event, right? Because it's super easy to patch. You just update your system. It's not like, uh, let's say log4j, which was also a remote code execution vulnerability, but also it was in a library that wasn't managed by a package manager. So updating could be non-trivial. Um, the second thing is hopefully there's not many untrusted users on your Linux machines. Uh, it's not like windows where every employee gets one Linux, hopefully only the admins do, and you trust those users anyways. And the limits, like you're not going to get social engineer to gain access to Linux. So like the whole, um, like number of exploit vectors is lower. Also, typically when I did pen testing, when I landed on a Linux box, I didn't need to get root access to achieve my objective. Because generally when I got on a Linux box, I did it through some type of web exploit. And when I do it that way, my main goal is the database. And well, if I exploited the website, the website has privileges to read the database. So I could just read it anyways. I did not need root access. Um, also, maybe I wanted to do it at, use the box as a jump box and do a lot of pivoting. And you don't need root access to use like SSH tunnels or chisel. So again, I did not really need um, root access on Linux whenever I did pen testing. Not to say that um, having root isn't fun. You can do a lot of fun things like persist in odd locations, backdoor the PAM module so you log all the passwords of users logging into the box. But typically speaking, that was not my objective when doing pen testing. So definitely patch your systems, but don't treat it as a sky is falling event, even though there is a cool logo that's a fun name because well, Looney Tunables, kudos to marketing for that one. But let's get into the actual exploit now. So I'm gonna make my webcam a little bit smaller so we can take a look at this. Um, it was found by Qualsys, and this is going to be the um, basic post about it. You can see pretty much what I was talking about with what distros are impacted. It affects the dynamic loader of glibc, and it does it through this glibc tunable environment variable. If you don't know what a tunable is, I don't know the exact purpose of it, but it lets you modify how glibc behaves without having to recompile anything, right? So if you wanna change like how malloc is working under the hood, you could do it quickly without having to recompile everything. So probably like a debug thing, if you're trying to make some tweaks and trying to find some optimizations, do it through a tunable. And then when you get something you like, then you put it into your program maybe. I'm not a developer at that level. So I don't know exactly why it is. I wanna say like Windows has the same thing with maybe a set execution policy, but um, not exactly sure. And this is all an off the cuff video with minimal research put into it. So a disclaimer, anything I say could easily be wrong. There's gonna be zero editing in this video, hopefully not even a single cut, because that means it just takes me longer to get this video out there, right? So the main thing I wanna point out is the technical detail post because this is where all the good information is. So it's very verbose in information. Um, so I'm not gonna read everything. I just have a few things I wanted to point out. Uh, let's see, there is a proof of concept string. So this is gonna be how you identify if your box is vulnerable. I did go ahead and let's see, I made a machine that just ran Ubuntu 22. And we can see that says seg fault as soon as I run it. If it displays the SU output, that means it's not vulnerable. But if you don't wanna build your own machine, and how I did this was I built, I got a Ubuntu 22 ISO. I installed it with the network card disconnected so it did not update. Once it was installed, I removed the unintended upgrades package and then connected the NIC and enabled DHCP. But if you don't wanna do all of that, then there is a hack the box machine called 2 million that is free for everyone to play that um, is vulnerable. So we can also use that for this. And also, um, if you do this box, you find out the credentials 
our admin for the username and super duper pass one, two, three. That is super duper pass one, two, three that you can use to log into this box and I must have typoed it. So let's do that and we get logged in, awesome. And I guess we can show the proof of concept string again to show it is vulnerable. Wrong clipboard, there we go. It does sag fault. So we know the box is going to be vulnerable. And let's see, you should read a lot of these links yourself. Um, again, I'm not going to read it all because it would take so long. Uh, the links will be in the description below, but let's go through this. Um, this is one thing I did like that they pointed out. So this whole piece here is talking about um, all the things they tried but failed because they couldn't get an exploit primitive working because of just where this buffer overflow was. It was like as the uh, program was loading up, so it had very minimal gadgets they could use to do anything, right? So this situation looked hopeless. And that's not something you generally see when you're like, oh, I got a buffer overflow. I can just exploit this program. It's not that easy in real life just because of um, all the exploit mitigations that get put into modern binaries. And also you don't know exactly where that buffer overflow occurred in the program, but they did find one exploit primitive. And that was, it used a minimal calic, which let them allocate some memory in a very malicious way, we should say, I guess. I don't know exactly everything that goes under the hood, but I, you don't have to, to put out good mitigations. And these links over here, are gonna be like all the detection rules. You can see this, detection rules, which is really cool because um, if you can read that small print, it is detecting a local account brute force and this exploit actually triggered that. So it is a noisy exploit that if you had like Elastic installed on your box and someone ran this exploit, chances are an alert would pop even though it was technically an O-Day. They didn't put any specific signature out, just their generic ones detected it. So we'll get into detection in probably 20 minutes, I think. I don't know. Um, so let's see. How the exploit works is they essentially poison environment variables and eventually land into this LInfoDTR path, which is the library search path. This is how your computer is going to know where libc or ld preload libraries are. Typically, um, this environment or this variable is just null. So then the program or the loader will go um, to your default system location, which I think is like lib64. But because we use this uh, calic to write memory, we essentially have access to write this path one out of like 3,000 times, I wanna say, because of ASLR. Um, it talks about that down here. But sometimes we can overwrite this path and then give it a new directory to load libc from, and that's how we exploit it. And I think that is pretty much all I wanted to go in this post, right? So there are a few binaries we can't use, like sudo because um, it specifies its own elf run path, user lib exec sudo, which overrides this environment variable. So even though we write this later on in the program, it will reassign that variable. Um, chage and passwd on Fedora because they're protected by special SE Linux rules. And I guess this will probably also impact CentOS and Red Hat. Um, snap confined on Ubuntu because of app armor rules. Uh, glibc234 is vulnerable, uh, but it uses some things and they didn't bother trying to exploit it. So um, the POCs probably won't work for 2.34. Now, there were a lot of exploits. The one I like the most is from this guy, Blasty. Um, and I like this one because I could get this working and find my own magical offsets if it was not supported by the program. And uh, we will show exactly how to do that. So let's download this program first. Uh, let's click here. We can save file gnu-acme. I already have that saved. I did not. So let's save it. Uh, let's move it here. So move downloads GNU Acme to this directory. And the first thing we should do is kind of just look at the source to analyze what's going on. Um, I'm debating if I wanted to use Visual Studio Code or just do V. We'll do V. Um, so the first thing 
we want to do is just make sure this code isn't malicious. We don't have to understand everything that's going on, but whenever you run untrusted code, which is just code you pulled from the internet, you should know it's not going to screw up your system. And we will be going over how to analyze the shell code. You could just copy and paste it into like chat GPT and it will tell you, but uh, that's not fun. We don't learn that much doing it that way. So that's not the way we're going to do it. Uh, we have these targets. This is going to be, I wanna say like the LD build ID. So this is like the version of uh, glibc maybe that you're running. And then this is a magical offset. So we're gonna show you exactly how to find these magical offsets because this script does make it easy for you to do that. And then you can kind of just look through these functions. I'm not gonna go through how everything works. Um, number one, I don't understand it. Number two, the main thing again I'm looking for is it's not going to like send a reverse shell out somewhere I don't want, right? Um, right here it's looking, oh, we got a shell. Then it's going to do an OS wait and return uh, zero X lead. So I think this is gonna be the exit code of the program. Uh, let's see, this is just creating like an L file. So this piece I think is cloning libc and then where libc main is, it puts the shell code we saw above. Uh, we have a check if ASLR is enabled. This is the exploit of it sending the environment variable. Build args, banner, architecture. And I don't see anything malicious. Here's where it's going to write the patch libc. Again, it's getting libc main and then putting our shell code. And if you are root, or I don't think you have to be root, you have to be root to disable ASLR, but if ASLR is not enabled, it will attempt to find all the magical offsets for you. So we will demo that once we analyze the shell code. And again, validate nothing malicious is going on here. And I didn't see anything fishy in the Python. It's a lot of just technical mumbo jumbo, but everything stood out as being in line with what an exploit does. I didn't see any like malicious thing of sending a reverse shell. So now the thing we can't identify by just our eyes is all this shell code, right? So I'm gonna put this over in less so we can copy and paste a bit easier. And I'm going to grab this shell code. Um, I guess we can do the exit code first because it's smaller, it'll be quicker. So if we look at exit code, how's it use it? I'm pretty sure this only goes if um, ASLR is not enabled. It's going to set the shell code to be exit code. If ASLR is enabled, it's gonna set it to be shell code. And the whole reason why it does this is when ASLR is disabled and it's trying to find offsets, this um, exit code is just going to behave in a way that if it runs, it tells the program exactly um, that it was vulnerable. So let's analyze the shell code. And I have this Python file already, which I called shell code to C. So we can just input the shell code. And I already copied that line. So this is going to be the exit shell code. It's just going to read it. And we're not going to create a C program. Let's just analyze it first. So I'll comment those out. And then we can write the shell code. So if I run this shell code, it's going to create the file shellcode.out, which is just that. Um, so let's open up Ghidra so we can analyze this real quick because this is really small, super easy to analyze. Uh, we could make this a C program and then step through it in GDB, but let's just do it this way. So create a new project. I'm not gonna really care about the name of this. Opening this, I'm gonna hit I, then let's see, what is the directory I am in? Uh, tunable, I could have guessed that. Tunable. I'm gonna specify my shellcode file, and then I gotta give it the language because this doesn't have any of the um, headers. So I just wanna say that is x86, it's going to be 64-bit, 
and probably GCC. Go OK, save file, let's analyze it, analyze, OK. And then we have the shellcode right here. And I think if I hit D to disassemble, it will go and convert those into the functions for me. So we can see it pushes 66, then pops that to the RDI register, then pushes uh, 3C, pops it to RAX, and does a syscall. So let's convert these. Uh, let's see, is there a convert? Convert to unsigned decimal. So it's going to put 102 and convert. Where was that? Uh, comments. It may be faster if I just like print F this function. Is convert like below this? I can just hold, hover my mouse, right? Uh, 60. So we want to look up what syscall 60 is on Linux. So let's Google syscall Linux. Uh, let's do table. And I like this one. I don't know why I could not connect to that. That was odd. And we were on syscall 60. So uh, whenever the syscall command is ran, it's going to execute the syscall that's in RAX. And then RDI is going to be the very first argument. Uh, I do have a Google here. This is the argument order. It uses RDI then, whoops. The first argument is RDI. That is getting annoying where that is. Second argument is RSI. Third argument is RDX, RCX, R8, and R9. Um, the main ones you need to memorize probably are RDI, RSI, RDX, because the it's pretty rare for a syscall to have more than three arguments. Um, so let's go back to this. We're at syscall 60, and that is just going to be sys exit and then the error code. So the error code was 102, or what was it in hex form? Uh, convert, let's go back, 66. So let's go look at our code. Uh, let's see, GNU Acme. Uh, let's do 102. There's 102, right? Yeah, oh, uh, yeah. Or 66. So here we have if air solar is disabled, and then this is going to be execute. If the execute is 0x66, it found a working offset. And that is the magical variable that you see here. So all that's doing is it does the exploit, but the shell code is just a exit with zero X, was it 66, which is 102. And if it gets that exit code, it knows that's a working offset and puts it here. So that shell code, not malicious. Let's go to the next shell code. I just like copying out of less more than um, them. So that's why you always see me hopping between the two. Uh, that is 32-bit. We want 64-bit. And this one's going to be a little bit harder to um, analyze just because it's larger. Uh, let's see. Let's go back to shellcode to C dot pi. And that's going to be this one, but we'll just rename it. or repaste it. So we got that. Put this all on one line. Get rid of that. And now we'll have our shell code. So let's do Python 3, shell code to C. If we can go back and Ghidra re-import this. Um, we got to select a language again, x86. GCC. Uh, we'll just do shellcode.out2. Analyze it. Sure. Go to the top. You could right click and do disassemble or just hit D, and then it will go in. Um, the decompiled output, not the greatest. You can just see it does three syscalls. So we could go and just see which syscalls it does. So whenever we see the syscall, go up to where it's uh, popping RAX, uh, 75, that is going to be 117. So if we look at 117, we can see that is um, set real user ID, I believe that is. 
I missed one syscall. So that was set user ID. Uh, we have 6B, which is 107. And that is get effective UID. So we're getting the effective UID and the output goes into EAX from this call. And then it's going to set all those registers, EDI, EDX, ESI, which are the first three arguments to EAX. So if I ran this on myself, uh, let's see, who am I? IPSEC, grep, IPSEC, Etsy, pass WD. It's going to, this right here, it's going to get my effective user ID, which is 1001. And then it's gonna uh, put those into EDI, EDX, ESI, and then call the set user ID to be that. But how um, set UID files work, it goes by the file owner typically. So as long as the file owner is root, then it'll escalate to root privileges, I believe. Um, so you figured out that syscall. And then we go here, this is 3B, 3B is 59. So let's go to the table and look at 59. Uh, we wanna go up, not down. That is exec VE. So this becomes hard to read. You could, again, I'll probably highlight over and look at it. Um, little NDN format, that's slash bin slash S, and this one is H. So it's putting uh, slash bin SH into RAX and then moving RAX somewhere. But um, typically when it gets like this, I don't try to analyze it by eyes or like by just going through it. I'll put it into a program and then GDB and step through it. So let's do that. So I'm gonna go shell code to C. We're going to not write it to a file, but I'm just going to print it to a C program. So if now I run this, we have it. And I'm probably gonna put this on my um, CTF scripts repo. So if you just go to github.com slash ipsec, then like CTF scripts, you'll probably find all this code. So you don't have to copy it. I go main.c, and then I wanna put the thing I just copied, which is the shell code. And this will just create an elf file to run the shell code. First, we use mprotect to make it executable. If we didn't do that, as soon as we tried to run the shell code here, it would crash because you'd be jumping to a um, not executable place in memory. So that mprotect just makes it executable. I have the flags I use to compile here. Um, but I also have a make file as well. So if we just do make, it will make the program. And then we now have shellcode.elf that we can run with GDB. And then you can do a L to show the source code. And now I can just do a breakpoint on uh, 13. And then we run it. We broke, and as soon as we hit this call RDX, now we're into our shell code, right? So we're pushing 6B to RAX. If we print F, um, let's see, percent D, we need a line break after that. And then 0X6B here. We can see that's 107. That was the get user ID. So let's now look at EIX. So um, print, uh, REX is the same. That is 6B. Let's see, oh yeah. So we have 6B now. I'm gonna run this shell code. We're gonna look at it now and it's 3E9. So if we do that print F again, so let's do print F, EAX, that is 1001. Again, that was my user ID. So everything's behaving as we expected. Um, this is now going to load that into all those registers. If my screen was uh, had smaller font, you would see it. The first one I think was RDI. You saw what it was there. We can run, we go up. RDI is now set to 1001. So it just sets all that. And then we're pushing 75. Uh, popping it to RAX, calling that syscall, and again, 
Uh, if we print F on this, it's 117. So that is setting the user ID. And then we run it. And here is where we get interesting. We're gonna push 0x68. And if we look at the stack, we just see H, step again. And that's going to move this string to RAX, push it to the stack, and we see RSP is now bin SH. We're going to push this, which looks odd. Then we're going to XOR it. And now that's just SH. So that was just a way to get SH onto the stack. And that is probably gonna be the first argument in that exec VE, or actually second argument, I should say. Then we push RSI, we're pushing eight, which is probably gonna be a length slash bin slash slash SH. This, this is eight characters, right? Let's just double check that. Uh, echo dash N, this, WC dash C, um, nine. Oh, we probably have an extra slash. Yeah, it's eight. I don't know where that extra slash is coming from, but I'm pretty sure it's just eight and that's what it is. Then we pop RSI and we can kind of see what it's doing. We get to the syscall. So now what we want to do is examine what each register is. So are we still at exec VE? We are. The first argument is going to be RDI and that should be the file name we want to execute. So if we um, print RDI, we have bin sh. So that is the first argument, is the file name. The next, we have a array, and that's going to be argv. Argv is typically gonna be the file name, not the full path of um, what you're calling. So that is register rsi. If we go up, we can see RSI is here. It's pointing to this, which is just SH. I think if we did, let's do X slash 4G X, I think. We can see it just goes to one string. And then a null thing, since this was an array, it goes until the null byte. Since we only have one argument, which was SH, we just see that here. If there were two arguments, you would see another address here and then a null. So we know there's just one argument. And then the last thing we have is RDX. So let's go up, look at RDX, and that is just nothing. So the um, environment when it's calling system is nothing, which is perfectly fine. So if we look at this, we can step and we're out of it. And oh, we're in a system shell. So that is the shell code. We have now analyzed the shell code to determine there is nothing malicious here. We could even, if we wanted to uh, do a sudo chmod or chown first, root root on shellcode.elf and then sudo chmod 4755 on it. And if we do an ID, execute it, ID again, we see our user ID is root. So awesome, everything works here. Uh, remove protected file, sure. So now let's go over to 2 million and just see if this exploit works. So um, let's see, before I do that, I wanna do one thing. Um, I think that's the root password, it is. So if you didn't know, on most of the newer Hack the Box machines, I say newer probably in the last year, we installed um, Laurel, which is going to be useful for um, parsing audit D logs. So I'm just gonna clear out all these logs because I have tested this before recording the video. So I just wanna make sure no artifacts are in any file. So there I just removed everything out of kern.log and I moved all audit D files. So now that we just have a raw box, let's do python3-m HTTP server 
And then we can W get 10, 10, 14, 8, uh, 8,000. I don't know why I did a slash there. GNU acme.py. We have downloaded it and we can run it. And we can see it already had the build ID here. So while that runs, if we look at it, we have the build ID and it's using 560. Once we exploit this once and go over the detections, I'm going to delete this and we're going to figure out the um, magical offset. So in case you come across a target that is vulnerable, but doesn't have an offset, you will know how to create it. And this can take some time to run. This is probably gonna go faster in this video than what you have, because in order to make this a bit quicker, I have disabled, um, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's Apport, which is the crash handler on Ubuntu. So if we look at, again, the advisory, it takes about 30 seconds on Debian and five minutes on Ubuntu and Fedora because of their crash handlers, Apport and ABRT. I just disabled this service and rebooted the box. So it does go a bit quicker. And here we go, we have a shell. I do an ID and I am root. So that is awesome. So let's go ahead and um, shoot. <laughs> I should not have exited. I do wanna be um, root again. Hold on, there we go. So let's look at it. We want to disable ASLR. So if I do an echo zero to proc sys kernel, then randomize VA space, ASLR is now disabled. So now let's go and look at this build ID. I know I said to say go over detections and then this, but um, my bad. I'm already doing this. So we'll go over this and then detections. So I'm deleting this piece from the targets. So the program no longer knows this target. ASLR is disabled. So now when I run it, uh, let's see, what's it see? ASLR is not enabled, attempting to find usable offsets. So it's going to run it. It told us the build ID. So we have that now. And it will probably take a minute or two. So I think I may, oh, did it find it? Uh, it came across something close. Uh, but here we go. We have working offsets. So any of these offsets will actually work. It doesn't just have to be one number. I don't know exactly what this offset is, but um, you can use it. So let's just go, I don't know what it was. 6-1 elf. So it was using 560. So let's use 614. Uh, we'll do 610. So if we hold control C, exit the program, V, G, N, U, Acme, paste this in, 610, save it. And what I'm gonna do is delete this directory. You notice the exploit will create a directory that is just a single quote that has the poisoned libc in it. That's where our shell code is. Um, I'm going to delete it because I don't know how much of the um, audit D logs we store and I don't want it to roll so we don't have this file create anymore. So I'm just gonna delete the directory so it recreates it. And we have added that build ID and this, I need to enable ASLR again. Type in the root password, echo one to proc sys kernel randomize VA space, Python three, run the exploit. So hopefully this goes somewhat quick and we will see the um, root code. Um, it's gonna really be bad if it never works, and that is a bad offset. Um, that would be a def definite curse of the demo gods, but I'm somewhat confident. 
So I guess while this goes, we can talk a little bit about the detections. So this post was where we got the exploit from. This was really cool. Um, our Linux detection rules unintendedly detected the Looney Tunables exploit. So if we look at this rule, it's actually the local account brute force. And what it's doing is looking at SU being used, um, I wanna say 10 times where the parent process is not bash dash ash sh, it's not a shell. I don't know what ClickHouse server is. I wanna say fish is like a um, minimal jail terminal. I don't know exactly what it is. I've definitely come across that before, but never ClickHouse server. But anyways, because the public POC uses SU, um, Elastic actually thinks it's a credential brute force and then flags it because it's seeing SU be started multiple times, which is cool. Um, if we look at CrowdSec, they have their own rules to detect it that they put out, I wanna say after the effect. Um, if we look at the kernel syslog, we do see a bunch of seg faults. So if you were just analyzing your logs and you saw, wow, we just suddenly had 2000 seg faults in like the span of two minutes. You may wanna go investigate that even if it's not an exploit because something bad is going on. So that's kind of what they're doing here. They're looking for a seg fault um, from the loader, right? So we have kernel. So in the kernel log, seg fault and the meta library starts with LD Linux. So they have a suite of detection, the LPE collection. So this is a local privS collection of just a bunch of detections, all free. So I would definitely recommend using CrowdSec if you don't use anything at all. Um, and Elastic did put out better detections. Again, this was just the one that happened to detect it without anything, but you could use any set UID binary minus the ones we talked about earlier. And if you'd use, let's say, ping that was set UID, this wouldn't detect it because this just detected it based upon SU being ran multiple times. So if we go in commit history of rules Linux, you can see all the things that they add and we can see a specific rule for the Looney Tunable exploit. If we go over there, we can see what they are adding. And this is a cool one. It's gonna look at the environment variables. And if you just add this rule, it may not work. You actually have to configure the agent to log or look at environment variables. And it does it specifically by looking, like you configure it to look for the glibc tunable environment variable. You probably don't want all your environment variables every time going over into your Elastic logs because, well, um, a lot of programs like web servers like putting passwords in environment variables because that's how they're just generally done. That's a very secure way to do it as long as you're not logging environment variables, right? It's just like when you do an HTTP request, you put all your credentials in a post request because post requests should not be logged. They're treat that data is treated sensitive. But now that they have it, if you are looking at environment variables, it's logging process and ver, glibc tunable, and it says runs five. So I'm guessing if a program runs five times in a quick succession with this environment variable, then it will flag, right? So now that we have a shell, we could analyze it ourselves. So if we go ver log and one of the things I like about Hack the Box, um, because I had them put this in, is we have Laurel logs. So I'm going to copy this audit D file. Hopefully this has files, I expected more. Okay, it does have things. So let's copy this over to our box. So we can do Python 3, HTTP server, wget 10, 10, 11, 211, I wanna say. Hopefully that is this box, audit.log. It is port 8000. Uh, what is the IP address of this? 221, I was close. Okay. So if I cat audit log, we have a lot of data. This is um, hard to go over, but if I just grep it for libc, we only have one event and I can pipe it over to JQ. And that was me doing rm-rf. I could have sworn we should see 
the Python program. This should have logged the file create of libc. And I can't really go over this right now. Uh, the video would be much longer, but hopefully later in the week, I find some time to look over my audit D rules, relearn exactly how it works and find out why it's not logging the file create event. Maybe it was something as simple as when I did this before, I was in like the temp directory and it logged file creates and temp and not the home directory, right? Um, but that's the importance of whenever exploits like this come out, you should test your own log files so you know how to detect it, right? If someone says, oh yeah, you just search Splunk, Elastic, whatever for file creates on libc, if you didn't actually test that you're logging it, it's very easy to miss it, right? So definitely there is importance in validating your logs, but if we wanted to detect it another way, uh, remember the kern.log flies a bunch of seg faults because you do crash the program a lot, hoping to get it working. So this is the foolproof way to detect it. You don't need any customizations. This is all out of the box logging. All you need is um, the kernel log, uh, which you're gonna have, right? I don't know. I've never installed a system and didn't have a seg fault being logged. Uh, it's also gonna be in syslog, which is also called messages on some systems. Um, if I grep this for a seg fault, we see it there as well. So that's going to conclude the video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Take care and um, definitely subscribe to the channel. Let me know in the comments if you like this and want me to do more deep dives into just detecting it, maybe figure out why Audit D didn't log it, show some demos of um, Elastic and CrowdSec detecting it, whatnot. Let me know what you wanna see. Take care and I'll see you all next time.